Welcome back, everyone. Now, today we are going to be taking a look at the classic King's Gambit opening. Now, many of you guys have been clamoring for videos on openings and various gambits. So today we will do just that. Now, before I jump into this video, the first and most important thing that I have to say is that I did record a video, which we did publish for about 10 to 15 minutes. And in that video, there was no sound, which means that I have to very unfortunately redo this entire video, but I will do my best to bring you a video of the same quality and content. Okay, so let's start with the first game that we have. Now, in this first game, I was playing with the Black Pieces against Jan Nepomniachtchi from Russia, the current World Championship Challenger. So the game starts, of course, with e4 here. We get e5, pawn to f4, and now I decided to take on f4. We get knight to f3, and now I play d5, which is known as the Abazia defense. Now, the idea behind d5 is quite simple. I want to make white have to commit to making a decision with this e4 pawn before white can get a quick quick development with bishop c4 as well as a big center with d4 so the main lines that black normally plays were lines with g5 bishop to c4 d6 and then d4 something along these lines but white gets a lot of quick development their ideas with castles their ideas with h4 and also g3 potentially as well now in this game this was a blitz game so i wasn't really in the mood to play some super hardcore theory and in particular in the king's gambit where white has a lot of straightforward ideas with attacks in, in a slower time control you can generally play it a little bit slower use your time figure Figure out what the best defensive setups are but in this case I thought I would play something a little bit more solid and to the point so I play d5 here now Jan decides to take on d5 it's worth noting that here if white tries to play e5 building the big center after g5 here if white plays d4 first of all there's g4 which is very strong but even if I just play a simple move like h6 for example you'll notice that the big difference here versus the main lines is that now you have the pawn on d5 and e5 but more importantly white cannot put the bishop on c4 targeting this long diagonal towards the pawn on f7 and the knight on g8 here so in this position after d5 white takes and now i play knight to f6 it's worth noting queen takes d5 is a move here but if you play this move white gets a lot of quick development here with moves like knight c3 forcing you to move the queen away and then d4 and once again attacking the pawn on f4 if you play bishop to d6 after bishop c4 knight to f6 here white can play queen to e2 queen to e7 takes takes and now the very important move knight to b5 here attacking the bishop on d6 which guards the pawn on f4 if you play a move like rook d8 after takes takes and bishop f4 white is a little bit better with the two bishops on the board additionally if you play bishop b4 check just c3 bishop to a5 bishop takes f4 and again king in the middle of the board white has developed all the minor pieces and black is in a lot of trouble so therefore I played knight to f6 targeting the pawn on d5 now here white is a couple of options white white can play a move like bishop b5 as we see in the game or a move like d4 or potentially c4 now for those of you who are newer to the game of chess you're probably wondering well if white just goes c4 and guards the pawn what's the big deal white will follow it up with d4 capture the pawn on f4 he's got a center great development and he's just much better but the problem with white playing c4 here is that black can now play c6 and white should trade the pawns on c6 but after knight takes c6 black gets really fast development if white plays bishop to e2 for example now you can go bishop to c5 preventing white from castling the king but also preventing preventing this d4 pawn push additionally if white tries to play d4 right away now you can throw in this check knight to c3 and now after you castle here white is in a lot of trouble if you play a move like bishop e2 there's knight to e4 additionally even knight e4 right away is very strong potentially because after white plays a move like let's just say queen to d3 here you have bishop to f5 and there are all kinds of problems on these multiple diagonals so c4 is is a move that you want to play but after c6 white is in some trouble so Jan plays bishop b5 here and now I play this move knight bd7 it's worth noting that c6 is also a possible continuation but I thought this would be a little bit simpler so after knight bd7 here we get castles from Jan it's worth noting that white plays c4 this is a line that was played in a game between a certain Hikaru Nakamura with the white pieces and Alexander Ivana with the black pieces now I do hope to do a video down the road of a couple of the games that I have played in the King's Gambit from the other side that being with the white pieces so you stay tuned for that in the future at any rate I play knight bd7 now we get castles being played here by Jan and I play bishop e7 it's worth noting that I could take on d5 but after a move like c4 removing the knight from the d5 square it feels a little bit awkward if I go knight f6 here white has d4 if I try to go bishop d6 guarding the pawn white can just go c5 bishop e7 and then after bishop takes f4 white has a great position here and if I don't play bishop d6 it's hard to guard the pawn additionally white has rook to e1 check as well so white's development is really really faster now it's worth noting that black can also try to play a move like 
knight to b6 for example but once again after d4 with ideas like bishop takes f4 maybe even potentially rook to e1 check as well it just feels a little bit awkward to play so I go bishop to e7 we get bishop to e2 and now here I decide to castle now again this was a blitz game so bishop e2 may look a little bit unnatural but there is some merit to it one of the lines that white would love to play here is c4 guarding the pawn on d5 but after a6 bishop to a4 I can now play b5 attacking both the bishop and the pawn and once white captures on b5 I can now castles and after knight c3 knight to b6 black is doing really really well here if you play a move like b takes a6 I can simply take rook to e1 and now play knight takes a4 knight takes a4 and knight takes d5 material is balanced but I have the two bishops here additionally this knight is really well placed in the center of the board and black is considerably better even if it may not seem obvious on first glance so bishop e2 has a purpose here which is now that if I castle white can play c4 like in the game and if I go b5 here trying to ruin the pawn structure white can just ignore it by playing b3 and after b takes c4 b takes c4 you'll notice that I can't really break up this chain if I go c6 I hang a pawn on c6 and if white gets d4 and bishop takes f4 and white is just going to be doing really really well here so in this position I have a tough decision to make now it's also worth noting that again after bishop to e2 here I could capture the pawn on d5 but I was very worried about c4 for the same reason after knight f6 and d4 I will again lose this pawn on f4 now of course for those of us who are rated 3500 and not human you will obviously play a move like knight to b4 here and after d4 the very rational move pawn to g5 guarding this extra pawn on f4 now of course for those of us who are not 3500 and those of us who are human um this seems completely insane here because the idea is to castle the king your knight is sort of out of play here white has pawns in the center and it's just not natural but at any rate the computers do say that this is playable so instead I castle here c4 I play c6 as expected we trade and now white goes d4 and I play bishop to d6 knight c3 and rook to e8 developing the rook on this open e file now this is really the first critical moment here in the middle game because what you'll notice on first glance here is that I have this open e file I also have a pretty good bishop guarding the pawn and I have ideas like knight g4 and knight e3 on the other hand however I do have these slight weaknesses on a7 and c6 and white has more pawns in the center so I have a very set idea with knight g4 and knight e3 potentially and if white tries to play h3 and stop knight g4 I can just go knight h5 and then knight to g3 as well so those are that's a, pretty much a straightforward plan that I have here playing with the black pieces but now let's let's flip this flip the script and look at it from white's standpoint so what does white have here white has a four on two majority on the queen side black has double stacked pawns on f4 and f7 so white should have a slight advantage in terms of the pawn structure but how do you activate the pieces your bishop is not great on c1 and your rook on a1 is not doing all that much either so the first idea is well to bring the rook into the game maybe you want to go b3 and fiat keto the bishop the problem with fiat kettoing the bishop is that after i say play a random move like bishop b7 when white plays bishop to b2 i can now go knight to g4 and you no longer have the bishop on c1 covering the e3 square and knight e3 would fork the queen on d1 as well as the rook on f1 so b3 while it makes a little bit of sense it doesn't do a whole lot and it's only going to help me improve my position with knight g4 and knight e3 down the road so you can't really develop the bishop on that diagonal now you'd love to capture the pawn on f4 but you can't really do that if you try to move the knight to say g5 for example I can just play h6 and if you go to h3 I can even go g5 here and now your knight is on the rim your bishop isn't great still on c1 and black is for choice if you try to play a move like knight to e1 going after the pawn on f4 this way now I can play the nasty move knight to f8 here because if white plays a move like bishop takes f4 you trade the bishops and I go knight to e6 forking the rook on f4 as well as the pawn on d4 now here if white tries to hang on to the pawn with rook h4 for example because the other two squares are covered on g4 and e4 I can now play g5 attacking the rook on h4 if white plays rook to h6 I simply go king g7 and after rook h3 we can swap the queens on d4 and now black is much better because you're attacking the rook on h3 as well as the bishop on e2 here so after knight e1 knight f8 white can't really capture if you play knight d3 here trying to go after the pawn again I just go knight to e6 and after knight takes f4 bishop takes f4 bishop takes f4 I simply take the pawn on d4 and with this great knight on d4 followed by a move like bishop f5 black should be very slightly better now I don't think this is any anything special where you're winning but black has no issues at all 
So white would love to go after the f4 pawn and develop the bishop this way. But again, as we've seen, it's not really feasible with either knight g5 or knight e1. So, so what are you going to do? How do you develop the bishop and the rook? Well, now you sort of shift away from those plans. And you try to think about other plans. Now, one of the things that you will notice in this position is that white's bishop on e2 is decent, but it's not super well placed. You don't have any scope on the diagonal towards a6. From d3, it would potentially attack h7, but from e2, it just really isn't doing anything. So the move that Jan plays here is a very thematic move, which is you don't don't worry about the queen side development but instead you worry about activating the light square bishop so what is played here is a move c5 now I go bishop to c7 and he plays bishop to c4 now this is noteworthy because now you have the bishop on the great diagonal but also you can follow it up with moves like b4 and bishop b2 or you can even go queen a4 and try to attack this pawn on c6 so white has really improved his position with the last couple of moves now here I played the move knight g4 and it's worth keeping in mind this is, this was a blitz game so I was trying to follow basic themes be practical and to the point however what I should have played was knight to f8 here now the reason I did not play this move at least as I recall is that I was a little bit worried about this move knight to e5 or potentially knight to g5 both these moves scared me now knight g5 is objectively a little bit better but after I play bishop to e6 knight takes bishop takes takes and, and in this position I now take with the pawn here and after bishop takes f4 you're like well white's just up a pawn black's in a lot of trouble but what I can do here is I can trade the bishop on f4 and play e5 attacking the rook on f4 as well as the pawn on d4 forking them and after d takes e5 rook takes e5 black is actually doing quite well because the c5 pawn is a little bit weak and if white trades and plays a move like b4 for example after a5 a3 takes takes rook to d2 due to the activity here black should be okay mind you white is still a little bit better with the extra pawn but in practice this should be a draw so again it's a lot to look at a lot to kind of like think about but in a blitz game you don't really want to spend all your time and so I decided that you know what I'm going to play knight g4 instead because it fits with the theme of putting the knight on e3 I cover the critical g5 square here so white cannot play knight g5 and I thought I'm just doing really really well so we get queen to b3 here and now I play rook to e7 guarding the pawn on f7 and now h3 is played here and I found a very important move which is to play rook to b8 now on first glance you're like well you want to go knight e3 that's the whole plan you played knight g4 but unfortunately after bishop takes knight pawn takes bishop white can now play the nasty bishop takes f7 move here because if I capture there's knight to g5 I cannot move the rook due to the pin and after queen takes g5 queen takes f7 king h8 queen f8 takes rook takes f8 this is of course the classic ice skater checkmate now for those of you who've been playing chess for far too long or most of your life if not your entire life you may know of this this checkmate as the back rank checkmate but in our new modern world we no longer call it that so after h3 in this position I choose to play rook to b8 an in-between move attacking the queen trying to force it to move off the b3 square so that there no longer is the same pressure on this f7 pawn Jan plays queen to a4 now I go knight to e3 in this position and here he trades I take back with the pawn and now he plays this move queen takes c6 now again when you look at this position you'll notice there are a couple of things first of all I have an active rook I also have this pawn on e3 so maybe I can try to push it down the board but additionally due to this capture on e3 my bishop on c7 has now become much more active it can go to f4 or even g3 and f2 or maybe there are some ideas with a checkmate on h2 down the road so Jan captures on c6 now I play bishop to b7 here forcing the queen to move now it's worth noting that in this position the best move according to our silicon friends is to play knight to f6 here the reason is that now when white plays d5 I have a very tricky move here which is rook to b4 attacking the bishop on c4 because after white moves the bishop to e2 I can now play bishop b7 and uh-oh spaghettio the queen on c6 is simply trapped here so after rook b4 white would have to play d6 but again I can play the tricky move bishop to b7 if white captures the rook after queen takes pawn queen is still trapped here everything is completely guarded and white would lose the game so when white takes the bishop on c7 after rook takes c7 here white is supposed to play bishop takes f7 rook takes f7 I guess after queen e6 the computer gives white a small edge but when queen e7 and the trade occurs black should be fine here you have a passive pawn c5 a little bit weak here bishop is on b7 is better than, than the knight on f3 so there shouldn't be all that much difficulty 
At any rate, I play bishop b7 here because it's a blitz game and I'm trying to follow basic themes. Jan plays queen to a4, and now I go bishop to g3. Now, the idea behind this move is that I would love to put this bishop on f2. I would also like to play moves like e2 and e1 queen down the road as well. Now, here, queen c2 is played. It's worth noting that in this position, if white plays c6 here, I can dodge the fork by playing knight b6, forking the bishop on c4 and the queen on a4. And when the queen moves to b3, I simply play bishop to f2 check, king to h1, and just gobble this pawn on c6. And now I am completely fine. So after bishop g3, queen to c2 is played here, and now I go knight to f6. It's worth noting bishop to f2 is a move, but after rook takes bishop, pawn takes rook, and queen takes pawn. White simply has two central pawns as well as a knight for the rook. And with all these pawns, in, in particular with the four on one on the queen side here white has very very good winning chances and computer itself actually gives white a pretty big advantage as you guys can see from the bar so instead I play knight to f6 here and now Jan plays d5 which is the best move in the position it's worth noting white has to do something really fast here because if you play a move like rook d1 I can now go bishop f2 check if you trade the rook for the bishop after takes queen takes f2 I can simply take on f3 if you capture with the queen you lose the pawn on b2 and if you take with the pawn after queen to d7 here targeting the pawn on h3 white can play something like king h2 but after queen f5 you have knight h5 queen f4 the b2 pawn is still weak and due to the exposed white king on h2 black should be okay does not mean black is better even winning but black has a lot of counterplay so Jan plays d5 here very thematic move and now I capture with the knight and here he makes a mistake he plays this move knight to g5 now it's worth noting both of us were getting fairly low on time at this point in the game and rook a d1 on first glance looks like the obvious move due to the pin of the knight on d5 but after rook d7 which breaks the pin I also stop knight to g5 here because then my queen captures and it feels like on first glance that white doesn't have much now again in this position with our computer computers to assist us we can see that white is actually better because after bishop to b5 knight b4 white can now play his move queen to f5 and after rook takes d1 rook takes d1 queen to e7 white can simply play bishop c4 here and with a great bishop on c4 the idea of rook d7 as well and knight g5 to boot white has a lot of play and computer gives white a fairly substantial advantage but again in a blitz game it's not really practical to calculate I think at this point we're both down to maybe 30 seconds so white is looking for something to do as fast as possible so Jan plays knight g5 trying to checkmate me on h7 now here I play a very important move the in-between move bishop to f2 check if I were to play knight f6 right away to stop the checkmate after rook takes f6 bishop f2 king h1 I'm simply lost because when I capture the rook there's queen takes pawn check king to f8 and queen to h8 checkmate so by playing bishop f2 first if white moves the king to h1 now I can play knight to f6 and because the bishop is in the way white cannot remove the defender the knight on f6 here and black is completely winning so instead Jan decides to take playing for counterplay I take back he takes and now I play h6 important move here by the way because if I were to capture on c3 white can maybe even play something like knight f7 and due to all the discoveries maybe white is okay although apparently in this specific line black is winning because you have knight e2 and of course typically you have queen d4 here but again for those of us who are human it looks really scary and without a lot of time to calculate h6 seems like the right move because if white moves the knight back I just trade everything off the board and with a weak pawn on c5 black should be winning so Jan correctly trades on d5 trades the knights off and now he plays rook to d1 here I decide to take the knight he snaps the bishop and now I go rook d7 now this is a good move for a couple of reasons first of all if I try to move my queen to c7 after rook takes g5 here white has a bishop and two pawns for the rook additionally their idea is like queen f6 or queen d4 and every single white piece is aiming towards my king on g8 so it feels very very scary here so by playing rook d7 this is two this is a dual dual purpose move first of all I'm guarding the pawn on g5 with my queen now if white trades after queen takes rook I guard the pawn on f7 so I basically guard the pawn I offer the trade of the rooks because I am ahead of material here and with less material on the board the rook on b8 should be better than the bishop on c4 additionally if white moves the rook off the file then I also control this open file on the d file as well so we get rook d6 here now I play queen to e7 rook takes rook queen takes rook and Jan plays c6 here trying to be very very clever now by pushing this pawn to c6 white is putting the pawn on a light square where it can be defended by a bishop either on d5 or f3 additionally it's only two squares away from reaching the end of the board 
So here I play queen to c7, Jan goes bishop d5, I play rook to d8, and now he goes queen f5, and I play this move queen to e7 back, simply guarding the two pawns on g5 and f7. Jan continues with bishop to f3, and now I play this move g6, and he goes queen c2. Now, the dust is pretty much cleared here. As you can tell, white is a bishop and a pawn for the rook, but it's a very advanced pawn, and the queen is behind it. However, the issue for white is that he can't really create two connected pass pawns, at least not very easily, because he's going to need b4, b5, a4, a5, and b6. And meanwhile, his king is a little bit weak on these dark squares. There's queen e1, there's queen e5, and it's a little bit hard to find a defensive setup, which prevents all these ideas. So in this position here, I play queen to e5, centralizing my queen trying to stop queen c3, keep an eye on the g3 and h2 squares as well, and maybe try to enter with my rook later on. b4 is played, I go king g7, now we get a3, and I play this move rook to e8. Now the idea behind rook e8 is quite simple. I want to go queen g3 and rook e1, checkmate creating the classic right triangle. We get queen to d2, now I go queen a1, sort of just a move to gain a little bit of time, we make a repetition, and now I play queen f6. Now it's worth noting here that I could try to take on a3, but it's actually quite scary because after queen d4 king g8 you'll notice that I have no checks the pawn is in the way of this diagonal and after c7 here I have nothing better than queen c1 but after queen to d7 this would lead to a draw because if I go queen f4 there's g3 and if I play rook to f8 for example white can now go queen to d6 followed by bishop g4 or bishop b7 and covering the queen f4 check so white is actually winning here so instead I play queen f6 we get king h2, rook d8, queen e3, just sort of dawdling a little bit, making some moves. I play a6 so that I don't hang the pawn and also stopping b5. Here, Jan goes a4. I make a check. He plays king h1. And now I take this pawn on b4. Now, this is a very big mistake as this throws away the win here. Now, at this point in the game, both of us were very, very low on time, so it's hard to be critical. But if Jan had found the right move here, he would have saved the game. Now, the right move is c7 here. Because if I go rook c8, white can play bishop to g4, attacking the rook. If I snap the pawn on c7, there's queen e5 check, which wins the rook on c7. And in this position, I really have nothing better to do than to play queen b1, king h2, and then f5. And after white plays a move like queen to e7, actually not queen e7, sorry. After white plays a move like queen to e5 and king h6, computer doesn't like this, so wait. Apparently, this is a draw here for some reason. Apparently, it's because of this move h4, which is not human once again a ridiculous move because after takes you check and on here you can just take and make repetitions every which way so again not very human and for those of us who are not 3500 and um, can calculate things in one second not obvious at all however if Jan had played c7 he probably would have saved the game instead he plays queen e5 I go king g8 he takes on g5 here and now I check now it's worth noting again I guess c7 here would have been reasonable because after rook c8 there's bishop to g4 targeting the rook queen guards the pawn on c7 and I guess here I have to play f5 and after queen to e6 check king g7 takes I now can make a draw with queen e1 king h2 check if king g1 I make the repetition and after g3 I can go queen b2 check king g1 check king f2 and now I just check on the dark squares and inevitably this ends in a draw so Jan misses this big opportunity instead he takes on g5 but now after queen b1 king h2 and queen b8 the queen and rook are guarded I'm preventing the pawn from moving to c7 and with this weak king on the back rank here I should be able to infiltrate either on the e file or on the b file with the rook we get king h1 here I play rook to e8 queen to d2 and now I find the important move queen g3 threatening to go rook e1 and win the game now bishop to e2 is played here by Jan and I go rook to b8. I'd love to play queen f2 here, but after c7, white is actually very close to being fine, because there's queen d8, queen d7. White will try to make a queen at the end of the board, and white should have no issues whatsoever. So instead, I play rook to b8 here, again, covering the c7 square with my queen, but trying to infiltrate on the open file, because open files or rooks are perfectly placed. We get queen to c2. Now I play queen to f2, and here he blunders with c7. White is still kind of hanging on with queen to e4 here, which guards the bishop and prevents rook b1. But again, with limited time on the clock, it's not a move that I would expect most people to find. So instead, we get c7 being played here, and now I go rook to c8. And the big issue for white here is that white doesn't have any good moves. You'd love to play something like queen d1, so on rook c7, there's queen d8. But unfortunately, on queen d1, I can go queen to b6. I cover the d8 square, so if you check, now I just take and win the game. And if you don't, say you play bishop g4, I just take. Because now after queen d8, king g7, queen on b6 guards the rook on c7, and it covers the d4 check. 
So you're completely winning. So after rook c8 is played, white will lose his pawn on c7, and the rest is pretty straightforward. We got queen to c4, queen b6, he takes, I take on c7. I could trade, but this endgame is actually very close to being a draw here, since white has a bishop and a pawn for the rook. So I take with the queen, we get queen d3. Now I play queen to f4, threatening to go rook c1 and end the game immediately here. Bishop to f1, rook c1, king g1, and now I just very quietly snap the pawn, because after queen to d8 check, I can go king g7. No check on d4, and then I can reset by putting the queen on a1, f4, a7, etc. So we get queen to e3. Now I go queen c6, guarding the rook, queen f4, check, king h1, queen c7. He plays queen f3. Now, of course, I don't mind the trade of queens because I have a rook versus a bishop. So we get queen to f3. I go queen c6, queen f4, do another repeat repetition to gain a little bit of time. Queen c4, king g1, I check. King h1, and now I go king g7, king h2, and here I play rook c3. It's worth noting, here I could play queen f6, forcing the trade of queens once again. But I play rook c3, queen to e2, I check on f4, king h1, and now I go queen e3, queen b5, and now I play the important move rook to c1 here, because now there is this very nasty pin. If white were to play king h2, I can now go queen f2, because I cover the b2 check, and after queen e5, king h7, it's simply hopeless, because once white moves the bishop, I can check and then play rook to e1, rook to e3, and with the king on the run here, this will be very, very basic. So instead, queen to b2 check is played. Now I go f6 here, Jan checks. Again, he could try a move like queen to b5, but after queen to f2, you will lose the bishop. You can check king here, but with the queen covering d2, you lose the bishop. That's all she wrote. So after f6, Jan plays queen b7, and now here I play the move king to h6, goes queen a6, and now I play queen to f2, and here he resigns in view of the fact that he cannot move the bishop because then he would lose the king, and if you lose the bishop here, that's GG as well. There's nothing you can do. So this was a very, very tense game that we played in the King's Gambit in this Abazia defense. At any rate, I hope you guys enjoyed it, and we're now going to move on to our second game. Now, in our second game, you guys, we have a game that I played with the black pieces against none other than Vasily Ivanchuk, as we like to say, Slava Ukraina. Now, Vasily Ivanchuk, very strong player, one of the very few players who has embarrassed Gary Kasparov in a classical ranked game. There's a famous game that he won in the Ross Limo variation where all of Gary Kasparov's pieces were on the back rank. At any rate, this game was played in Cap Dag in 2010, so let's dive right into it. So the game starts with e4, e5, f4, and now I play the very tricky move knight to c6 here. We get knight to f3, and I play f5. Now, those of you guys who have looked at the King's Gambit, you probably have not seen this variation very frequently because it is a very aggressive try here. I am basically pushing out both of my pawns here on the, on the king side, just like white has pushed out both of his pawns. So after f5, Vasily plays this move d3. Now, there are a lot of options here. First things first, if you're new to the game and you see this line, you probably freak out and you're like, what's going on? I can just take on e5 here. Because after pawn takes, you have queen h5 check, g6, knight takes pawn here. And after pawn takes knight, you can simply gobble the rook on h8. White's up a rook for a knight, completely winning, right? Well, not so fast. Because if you play knight takes e5 here, I can actually swap the knights on e5, and then I check u on h4, and now white's king is exposed. If you play g3, I can play queen takes e4 check. Right triangle again, which wins the game, because after queen e2, I snap the rook, and that's all she wrote. If white tries to play uh, king to e2, after takes, king g3, there's bishop c5 check, king g3, f4. Let's just say white goes king h4. This is one sample line. There's bishop to f2 check, king to h3. You can play d5, checking the king. And after g4, you play n peasant, f takes g3 check, and white gets mated in a couple of moves here. After queen to g4, you can simply take king g2, and then queen to e4 would be checkmate here. So this is just one example of why knight takes e5 is not playable. Now you might think, well, then maybe you can take with the pawn, but if you take on e5 with the pawn here, after black plays f takes e4, your knight has no good squares. G5 and H4 are covered by the queen on D8. If you go to D4, I snap the knight. So because you can't move the knight to any of these three squares, the only logical square that remains is knight G1. But after knight takes E5, black is simply up a pawn in the center and should be completely winning. So the only other line that white can play here, which is possible, is to play this move E takes F5. Now E takes F5 is, is definitely one of the most challenging approaches. And I don't even know these days what the state of the theory is exactly, but black will normally play E4, knight to E5, and I believe it goes takes, takes, and then queen to E7 here. And if white checks on H5, you go king D8. 
and it's a big mess white should probably play d4 takes and then queen g5 and white maintains a small advantage it's worth noting bishop g5 actually doesn't do anything because i can go knight f6 here you cannot capture the knight because then i capture your king and if you you can't move the queen to e2 because the pawn captures and if you move the queen i just snap on e5 i gobble the pawn on b2 and the rook on a1 and that's all she wrote Additionally, if white takes with the bishop after pawn takes, again, you're going to lose this pawn on e5 and be in a world of hurt. So e takes f5, e takes f5 is, is challenging. And after e takes d3, queen g5, the game goes on. I don't know what the exact evaluation of this position is. Computer says after d takes c2 and knight to c3, white is a little bit better, but this needs deeper analysis. And I'm obviously not going to go super deep into the weeds in this video. So we get d3 being played by Vasily, a very, very passive move, not necessarily bad, but it, it isn't challenging. I go d6, knight c3, now I play knight to f6 here, and we get our classic mirror. All the pieces are on the exact same squares. g3 is played, I go g6, bishop g2, bishop g7, and now Vasily decides to take on e5 and break the tension as well as breaking the mirror. So we get f e d e, bishop g5 is played, h6, bishop to e3, now I castle, he castles and now i decide to take on e4 and after d e4 bishop e6 once again we pretty much have a mirror except for the fact that i have a pawn on h6 instead of h7 that being said this should be an advantage from the standpoint that i can always play for knight g4 because white doesn't have a pawn preventing it and white cannot play for knight g5 here because my pawn on h6 prevents that move so in this position after bishop e6 we get pawn to a3 being played by Vasily. i go king h7 just a logical move to guard the pawn on h6 now he goes king h1 and i think the reasoning behind this move is that if i do go knight g4 to target the bishop white can slide back to g1 with the bishop so i play a6 here we get bishop g1 now i play rook to f7 now this move is sort of multi-purpose first of all i want to have options open for the rook when i play rook f7 one idea i can go for is to play queen e7 and then stack the two rooks on the f file here and try to attack another idea behind rook f7 here is that i can actually play for rook to d7 so if white plays h3 i can go rook to d7 queen to e2 and then go queen e7 followed by rook d8 trying to stack the rooks on the d file so it's a very flexible move which is multi-purpose so in this position we get queen to e2 now I go knight to d4 and here queen to d3 is played by Vasily now knight d4 really breaks the harmony of the position but at this point in the game since this was played in a match format I felt really really good so I decided to trade he takes with the queen I go rook d7 trying to claim the open d file rook a d1 is played and now I go bishop g4 takes and here I make a slight mistake now if this was not played in a match format where it's a best of two almost certainly I would have taken the rook with the queen played for rook d8 and kept the game going but because we were playing in a match format I figured it's two games if I draw this first game with the black pieces surely I'll have great chance in the second game with the white pieces so I decided to take the queen and go right into this forced end game here now after bishop to e3 there is one important nuance this move stops me from playing rook to d2 creating the classic kebab as xqc would say but it also has other purposes as well in this position if I play king g8 white can potentially take the pawn on h6 because after bishop takes rook takes f6 white is up a pawn now mind you in this exact position computers show that bishop c1 would still save the game but that is pretty much beside the point so I can't really play king g8 here additionally if I push h5 I yield the g5 square and now this pin is really nasty and if I play this move g5 which is what I do in the game there are a couple things that happen first of all it creates a weakness on the slight square of f5 but additionally in an end game I'm now putting these pawns on the dark squares where the bishop on e3 can always potentially attack them so after g5 we get h3 here I go king g6 and now g4 is played an excellent move by Ivanchuk because now it fixes the pawns on light squares versus dark squares here I go c6 idea just to prevent knight to d5 at some point rook f2 is played and I go b5 now here rook d2 is played and I swap the rooks and on first glance you're looking at this like okay very boring this is just a classic grandmaster draw game is going to end in a couple of moves and that's all she wrote right well not so fast the reason that I say not so fast is because again when you look at the pawns you'll notice these pawns are on light squares these pawns are on dark squares so black has to be a little bit careful here so I play bishop f8 we get king to f3 guarding the pawn so that white can remove this knight to another square and reroute it here I play h5 which is a mistake even though the computer thinks it's okay it's a mistake because what happens now is that when white moves the knight and I trade this pawn on g5 is now a permanent weakness whereas if we go back a couple of moves here if I play a move like king to f7 for example pawn is always guarded but once I play h5 and trade now I always have to be mindful of this weak pawn on g5 
versus before where it was protected. So after knight, after h takes g4 is played, I go knight to d7. We get knight to c1 played by Ivanchuk, trying to reroute the knight to d3 where it can attack the pawn in e5, and maybe also go to b4 and force the pawns on c6 and a6. I go c5 here, plays knight a2. If he did play knight d3, then I would just play c4. Knight a2 is played, and now here I make a big mistake. I play this move knight b8 with the very simple idea of going knight c6 and knight to d4 here. Now the problem with this move is that after I play knight b8, white can play this fantastic move pawn to c4, which leaves me with three pawns which are fixed on dark squares because when I capture this free pawn or seemingly free pawn on c4, white can actually win this double pawn eventually. So after knight c3, I go knight c6, knight d5 is played, and now I go check, king to e3, and here I play king f7 because now the bishop can no longer capture the pawn. Unfortunately, white can now play knight b6, and when I go king e6, knight takes c4, you'll notice that there's a little bit of a transition where white has all, has all these pawns on light squares, but I now have one, two, three pawns that are on the same color as this dark square bishop. Now, computer still thinks that this is maybe holdable after bishop e7, king d3, and something like knight f3, but for us puny humans, that's not super realistic. Additionally, there is another important theme to note, which is we have this theme in the game of chess and end games in particular, and also in some, some middle games as well. But normally it goes that if you have one weakness, your position is holdable. You can probably still save the game because you can guard and fight tooth and nail to hold on with that one weakness and just defend it. Now, when you have two weaknesses, generally it's thought that you're going to have difficulties. Like there will be significant winning chance for your opponent. But when you reach a position like this, where I now have three weaknesses, almost always it'll be, it'll be very tough, if not impossible, for someone who isn't 3,500 to defend. So I go bishop e7. Bishop to a5 is played here, and now I go knight b5. We get king to d3, and here I make this huge blunder by playing knight to d6. Now, again, the computer says that after knight d4, knight to e3, and knight f3, black can maybe survive, but after king to c4 here, say bishop f8, you're very worried about moves like bishop b6 here, even a4 first, followed by bishop b6, and long term for a human, I think it's borderline lost. Unfortunately, because this was a rapid game and both of us were getting a lot of time, I just played knight d6 without thinking. And unfortunately, after knight takes d6 was played, I realized my mistake and I simply resigned the game because now when I take the knight on d6, white can go king c4, king to c6, and play bishop to d2, targeting the pawn on g5. When I go bishop f6 guarding, white plays bishop e3, bishop to e7. I'm temporarily guarding both pawns, but now white can play the very nasty move a4 and just wait. If I ever move the bishop to f6, I hang c5. If I go to d6, I hang g5. I also can't move my king. King d6 hangs the pawn on c5. King b6 allows white to play b4 due to the pin. And once again, white is winning. So I can't move my king. I can't move my bishop. And when I play a5, white now goes b3 here. And the game is over because... I can now maybe go king b6 since b4 is not a move, but white will go king d5, and it's Zugzvan. If I move the king, I lose the pawn. If I move the bishop, I lose one of the pawns as well. I can also, I also lose the e5 pawn, so every single pawn here is loose. And more importantly, there's a very important theme here, is which when you look at the position, I have one, two, three, four pawns on dark squares. White has one, two, three, four on light squares. So white's bishop can target my pawns, whereas my bishop cannot target his pawns. So it's just lost. And it's very, very thematic that we see this. Now, in general, this was played in a super jam game, so it's a little bit different. But I would recommend that if you're reaching end games, which are like bishops or bishops and knights, uh, where the bishops are the same colors, be very, very mindful of the placement of your pawns and trying to avoid putting them on the same color as your opponent's bishop or having your opponent's pawns be on the opposite color of your own bishop. At any rate, I lost this very tough game. Now, in the rematch of this best of two match, I did actually play a king's gambit with the white pieces. So I will be doing a video very soon recapping some of those games that I played with the white pieces. But for now, I hope you guys have enjoyed this recap of a couple of great games that I played in the king's gambit opening on the black side. And make sure to hit that subscribe button below, and we'll be back very soon with some more great YouTube content. Hope you guys enjoyed it. See everybody very soon. Bye.